Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hey. Oh, everyone tired already. Okay. So, my name is Markus Andritzak. Uh, what I do, I'm a practitioner on innovation and helping companies to come up with the right products and um, rather with products that their clients need or helping them set up an organization that creates products that the clients need. And on my journey from trying this in the beginning and maybe failing myself to being fed up with failing with it all the time, I kind of acquired some techniques, knowledge, and methodologies. And all throughout the journey, there always were some counterintuitive things happening all of the time. So I began with uh, developing software and when we started uh, doing stuff like um, extreme programming at the time, so the book came out and we were like, yes! That's what I want to do all the time. These great guys had the right ideas. There was stuff in it which was called pair programming. So we wanted programmers to work in pairs. And that was, of course, totally counterintuitive to the people paying us. Like, why would I and this guy work in a pair together? It seems lame and slow. So why would you do it? But we found out it's a great way to come up with um, great quality and, and good things. Actually, it makes things work faster. And it went on like this all the time. Um, what we discovered also was stuff like um, if we put too much emphasis on um, heavily loading the system of development, so people having to do all the time, we actually get slower because the system gets stuck and we build up traffic jams in developing stuff all the time. So it's also counterintuitive to the managers that we should actually don't not load the system to 100%, but maybe only 80% have 20% slack time for people and gets actually faster. So all these things happened, and the same happened um, on the product side. Many things we do are counterintuitive to management and the people we work with, and some of these things I want to talk about this evening. So the topic is innovation, and about innovation being a misnomer, a misunderstanding in a way. And where does it come from? In my current job, um, the situation is that most of the people come to me and want innovation, and then my question is, what do you mean? So if you guys want innovation, what do you actually mean? I mean, all, everyone's here because it's a design thinking uh, meetup and anything. So what's innovation to you? I don't have a clue. Do you? So anybody speak up? What's innovation to any of you guys? I don't buy it, by the way. So who has a clue? Yeah, over here. An idea that's uh, brought successfully to the market. Successfully to the market. That's a good one, so it's not any um, invention that doesn't create any value, but uh, an invention that creates value on the market in a way. Any more ideas? Like um, the iPhone, was it an innovation? I mean, people say things like, you know, there was smartphones before, so was it an innovation or not? Was it? Yes. Why? Because it uh, did a good job in recombining uh, many things that were uh, that uh, you had smartphones, uh, you, had, you had normal phones, but uh, the possibility to, to touch and so on. Okay, so the touch stuff was yeah. an innovation because my Samsung smartphone before that also did music, it did the dates and the email and the web and all the stuff. So, okay, so there was one new element. So, one element seems to be enough. Okay, one new element. So, what's not innovation then? Just touching. The display is innovation, great. And <coughs> uh, disrupted the market. Oh, it disrupted the market. Okay. So that's the thing. The big point of innovation. So if I create a new machine that helps me to develop the iPhone a little cheaper, is that innovation or not? It might create value in the market because I have a bigger margin and I might disrupt other companies with that. So because you don't understand technical engineering and machines are not important to you, maybe? So is it, is it that innovation is kind of a point of view? I like things, so it's innovative. I don't like things, so it's not innovative. I would say innovation is a totally new approach somehow. I mean, just to make some things a little bit better or <coughs> they are more successful on the market, there's not a real innovation. Right? Innovation means for me that it is really a new approach to to solve a problem. Yeah, that, that would be my uh, definition too. It's a new solution for old problems. Ah, okay. So creating a new car engine 
engine that's way better and a different way of another innovation? I mean, it's simple like, okay, you have then a better car. Okay, so you, would, you wouldn't say Tesla innovated anything. <laughs> So here we are, that's great, that's my problem. People want innovation from me, I don't have a clue what they want. So please, Marcus, come to us, take care that a company gets more innovative and I'm like this. You know, there's tens of millions of opinions in the company. One says Tesla is innovative, the other one says no, not really because car engines are boring. So it's opinions against opinions and it doesn't help anybody. And my main problem is that while everybody wants innovation and doesn't have a clue what it is, still nobody wants to pay the price for it because of course innovation doesn't happen just by I want it and it's a cool new thing to do. It's hard work in a way. So that's a real problem to me. Nobody knows what he wants, but nobody wants to pay the price as well. So how could we go on with innovation in any company? It's a real hard thing. Um, to spice things up a little, I have a question. So let's imagine you guys are founders. Who is a founder in here in the company? Who founded the company? You founded the company. Oh, lots of founders. Okay, so what's the typical founder thinking? I mean, these founders are a little bit risky, you know, otherwise they wouldn't found a company because it's somehow kind of risky. <coughs> so what do you think is the most favorite bet amongst average founders? Is it, I give you a company with five million, million, not millionen, upside with a 20% success chance. That means five million dollars that you make for granted. Or is it B, I give you guaranteed two million success chance, uh, upside by 50% success chance. Or is it the least risky one, 1.25 million? upside with an 80% success chance. What do you think if I ask like 100 founders, what would they choose? Being entrepreneurial and all the risky guys they are, you know, daredevils. Who, who goes for A? Okay, some of the guys. Who votes for B? <laughs> You're cheating. <laughs> you can't make your mind up. Okay. So who votes for C? Yeah, the majority is right. So founders are not actually that risk taking. They kind of manage their risk portfolio. They take the one risk in the business, they wanna kind of manage it, but in private life, they're anything but a daredevil. They, they're not devil, daredevils privately. They're actually uncomfortable of having to go the risk of found, having to found a company which actually only has 80% uh, um, success chance. That's interesting, because if you sit inside a huge company, what you think is you have all this envy for all the entrepreneurs out there who go and can go for all the risks to actually do what they want, and then what you find out is they're not these daredevils at all. That's a bit strange somehow. So should we be enviful? Now some uh, little history of um, the past week. Let me destroy this first. So, some days ago, on the 9th of February, this year happened. Who knows what it is? What happened on the market? Amazon did something. What did they do? Yeah? Yeah. Right, so Amazon made a game engine available to the market for free. It's called Lambyard, it's really advanced, it also includes access to a platform which um, enables players, gamers to exchange videos and messages about what they do right now on the platform. So it's a really advanced game engine doing everything you would imagine as a game developer. So you might say not being involved in the gaming market, you say, yeah, yeah, it's what they do, you know, they come up with free stuff. And if you're involved in the gaming industry, you say, you know, hmm, what happened? Everything we have as a gaming company is a game engine and some creatives. So if they rob of us, half of our potential, the gaming engine, and give it away for free, what's left for us in the market? What a surprise, what a bad surprise. 
we might go broke, whatever. So it's basically the democratization of gaming. Everybody can be a game developer right now. It's the breakdown of monopolies in the gaming industry. You don't have to heavily invest in a gaming engine. You can just develop any complicated game to be sold on the PC platform and whatever platforms by using this gaming engine for free. It's millions of investments saved. So what a surprise. And what a bad surprise. But actually, no. So what this guy, a brilliant strategist from Great Britain, says, anyone in that world currently going shock, horror, Amazon is coming to our space, should be ashamed. And he's taking gaming as one example. But everybody in all the other industries that Amazon is coming for should be ashamed as well. Because what is the strategy of Amazon, of course? Breaking down all of the other industries and the margin of the other industries is their chance they're going for. Wherever there's a margin, they want to go in and destroy the market. So in gaming, it's that for the last four years, there's been clear signals that Amazon wants to go there. If you don't realize, it's your fault. Even the FAZ realized it. So Amazon bought Twitch. What do they want with it? Was a question. That was in August 2014. If you can't read these signs, you're lost in your industry. Of course, Amazon wants to eat you. So if you think Amazon is one of a kind, let's look at this. Of course, Google is doing the same thing. And I've been in so many industries that were just afraid of being eaten up for breakfast by Google. If it's just um, classifieds, Kleinanzeigen, they're in total terrific horror of being eaten up by Google. If they just want to start the right project, we will be gone. Anything about price comparison on the internet is in total horror because of what Google might be doing if they just want to start going for them. Any industry you might know that just has to do with connecting knowledge somehow is totally afraid of Google. So Netflix, first they were just this video rental, now actually they came up with all the streaming stuff and they're totally going for the content market, creating content by themselves nowadays because they need it. So, Amazon as well, right. So, then this one, Spotify. The next one who just came along and he didn't ask for permission, of course, they just did it. Also, of course, Airbnb. They started with showing up some, some nice private places, but now it's actually a threat to the hotel industry, in a way, and they're really taking it for serious now. So Uber is one of the more prominent ones. So of course they're going for logistics, not just for cabs. It will take logistics another year, some another years to actually realize that it's about logistics, not just about cabs and all the things. They're just blind to the attack. You might not like Uber because the founder, Kalanick, is kind of a prick. Whatever, he still is going after you if you're in that industry. It doesn't help you that he's a prick. Actually, quite the contrary. So we might think, you know, I'm not a cab driver, I'm not in the streaming, I'm not in the content industry, I'm not in all those threatened industries. Maybe social um, media is something for you. And um, who actually in the room does understand what Snapchat is? Who knows Snapchat? So everybody knows that. Who knows what it does? Who knows how to use it? How do you use it? Sadly, because it just started using it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't count. Who actually knows how to use Snapchat? What do people do on Snapchat, for Christ's sake? Does anybody know? So this is a report where Ben Rosen of BuzzFeed actually asked his little sister to step in and explain to him what it, she does on Snapchat. What he found out is, in the evenings, she sits there in front of the TV, using it as a second screen, and what she does is, in one minute, she answers 40 snaps, 40 Snapchats. What it does, and what it means, is she needs to take 40 photos of herself in one minute, put a comment beneath them, or a nice painting or something, and send it back to the person who actually came up with that. So that's what the youth is doing with Snapchat. And we don't have a clue. It's one of the 
fastest rising social networks out there. Huge increase of user rate, usability, using rate, um, permanent users on his messages spent and, and exchange and all these things. So this is on the rise and none of us knows what it is. Even Gerhard. Who's <laughs> <laughs> just a novice. So I come back in a month and ask you how many snaps you can do in one minute. So this is how people use it. And actually what they do with it, they, they track each other throughout the whole day. If you're not on it all the time, you're lost. You're a corpse on Snapchat. You need to be on it all the time. So basically, if we look at all these examples, everyone, every industry is game to them. They want to come up for everybody. Wherever there's a margin, they want to go for. And it's not just Amazon and Google. So basically, innovation is permissionless. They don't come along and say, you know, may I please destroy your market? They just do it. By just being ruthless and innovating all the time and looking for opportunities all the time, how can we attack you? I will do it. <coughs> so the reactions, we know them. It's panic and outrage, like with Uber, you know, Mr. Kalanick is a prick and what he does is, not, is unethical and he shouldn't do it. We have laws up over here, he should abide to the laws and everything. It doesn't help, you know, in some years the laws will be gone and he will be here, if we like it or not. So, this doesn't help you. So, what do companies then say when they come to me? We are threatened, of course, so please, can you help us to scale innovation in the company? Can we do it? Oh, you know, innovation is great, is great stuff, and what we know is ideas come from everywhere, we just have to recognize them again, so everybody is enabled. We need more product, it's what they do in the Silicon Valley, they have the real good product guys, they buy them so they have a good product and it helps them. We need more designers, that's the other trend in the States, we have more designers, we actually insource the design agencies and the companies so they do that we don't have the knowledge outside of the company anymore, but inside, great stuff. We need more UX, of course, because that's why Uber is so great, because the UX actually kind of lets us get over Kalanick being a prick. And we're prepared anyway because we do Scrum already and Scrum delivers innovation. Just look at Wikispeed, you know, Wikispeed is actually building a car based on Scrum. So my question is, what's innovative in building a car on Scrum? I mean, we know how to build a car personally since, I don't know, what is it, 100 years or something? So now Wikispeed can do it with Scrum. Fantastic. What's the value created? And I say, this is really boring. I mean, if you guys want to build a car on your own, do it, but let's not call it innovation. What's the point? So another technique is we build spikes so we get more frequent feedback and fast feedback so we are prepared for innovation. I don't think so. So what companies do then is this. Or let's give people slack time. It will solve all the problems we have. 20% time. Hackathons, hackathons to the rescue. Maybe one hackathon a month will self solve the problem. Maybe it's one each week, I don't know. Does it do harm? No, let's do more hackathons, whatever. Wisdom of the crowds. Open spaces, same thing, open space. The more open spaces, the more innovative you get. Scrum to the rescue again. And if all of this doesn't really help, let's do some offsites. I will get you to having some ideas. You will solve the problem, thanks. Or a two-day workshop, it's always great. You know, we don't have a clue, but a two-day workshop outside somewhere at a nice lake, it will help us all. Okay. Real focus, all these things, focusing on the right problems, right challenges, finding out the right person how to serve and so on, it's all great. So, even better might be a two-day innovation workshop. <coughs> Not this boring stuff. Now we can do it real. A two-day innovation workshop with clients. Fantastic. Have the inside right at the space. Or do a two-day innovation workshop with design thinking. Maybe on top of it even with clients. <laughs> Fantastic. Or, even better, just right now, a book comes out on the Google Design Sprint. How do they actually do it? 
Now it's written in the book, we can do it as well. So let's go outside and have a Google Design Sprint. It's five days, yay, hip. Fantastic. Or strategy offsite. No, if you don't have any clue, let's have a strategy offsite. The big ones are in the boat as well, so we get instant feedback from the CEO and his guys, his fellows. It might solve the problem. Or co creation, you know, who doesn't know about co creation? What is co creation? Who heard about co creation? Who did co creation? So, what is it? Lots of hope is on it. Does anybody know a product that is successful based on co creation? A famous product? Any. <laughs> Please, come on. I mean, this is hype stuff. You need to know a product that is based on co-creation that is successful. Really? <laughs> no one? Steffi, please to the rescue. Oh, okay, for sure. So I can tell you about one thing. Um, for example, if you come up with the Nike ID shoes, where you actually come up with a design, that's the perfect example of co-creation. It's huge margin, it's really individualized, and it's actually down to the original definition of co-creation, which means the customer is actually a part of the value creation of the product. So it's not like we invite all the customers to actually ask them for their ideas and then we build them and all these things. It's the customer is core to the value creation of the product. So I define the design of my shoe and then I get the shoe. That's real co-creation. So it's great stuff, but actually who does it, who understands it? Well, you know, not that many people. Now let's go to the heavy tooling. This was all the light stuff. We can just do it. Now heavy tooling. Let's reorganize. If I really don't have a clue, I reorganize my company all of the time. We really get deep into organi organization design. One of the favorite things to do is actually to copy Spotify with the guilds and all these things, you know? Actually, Spotify doesn't do it anymore, but who cares, you know? They did it. And obviously they're successful. We don't know how much money they get, how much they spend, but anyway, let's copy what they do. We don't have, don't have a clue what the culture is, how they think about these things, but let's copy the org design they have. What actually was the last innovation of Spotify? I don't have a clue as well, so anyway, let's copy it. Or holacracy. Who heard about holacracy in the room? Quite a few, so. You read the Lalu book and you say, yeah, I want to be more teal. I want my team to be more teal. I want my organization to be more teal. It's great stuff. And I will make you more teal as well in about a month. Or we do it as the guy in America who actually said, you know, I want my whole organization to be a holacracy and who doesn't want to go with me, um, he can quit, which leads to 30% of the people actually quitting and who cares, you know, it's just game. Well, you know, if all this doesn't work, we can actually fire people. You know, Gerhard, I tried it for two months to actually make you more teal and it really didn't work out, so thanks. <laughs> Still nice to meet you, privately, for a beer, but not here. You're not teal enough. So hiring then again, because I just got rid of Gerhard, finally. So I would actually like to have you in my company because you look really creative and I think this will really work out, so thanks, Jakob. Great. Yeah, nice. And I will do with like 20 of you guys and get 20 more in. Steffi needs to be in there as well because she has all this design thinking experience. So we'll have a great new thriving company. So I hire you guys and this is how we start again. Fresh new life, a run at the beach, fantastic. Well, after six months time, it turns out that some problems come up because, you know, you have all these great ideas. Jakob especially. <laughs> it's like, and I really love to have a coffee with you all the time, but you know, you get a little bit more pragmatic. This is just crazy stuff we cannot do. We have a brand that is really well known and we cannot risk it with your crazy ideas, guy. And Steffi, I have a similar comment to you because I really value your methodology and all the knowledge that you have, but please come up with something pragmatic. Okay, so after just six months, Jakob and Steffi get a little bit impatient with me and actually thought the job is a bit different from what they think it is, sadly. Because actually what they came up with is really great, but somehow not what I think was my expectation. So are the tools all wrong? Is Jakob wrong? Is Steffi wrong? 
was Gerhard. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> poor Gerhard, you know, I mean, I just sacrificed him just like this, you know. No, even, even Gerhard wasn't wrong, actually. So something went wrong. And maybe I'm wrong, you know, <laughs> I don't have a clue. So I, I forgot to say in the beginning, you can question everything I say here. It's just my experience. Um, so my experience is that context and purpose of these tools are all the time misunderstood or not understood at all. We just hear some hype on the internet, say, yeah, holacracy, yeah, let's try it, whatever. 20% time, great. Next Friday, we give it a try, and so on. Open space, fantastic. We might actually buy a moderator for a facilitator for 2,000 euros a day and have a nice open space with 150 people. Oh, we forgot to actually prioritize all the ideas and actually follow up on anything of it. Hmm, strange that people are demotivated after three months' time. Hmm, whatever. So the tools are not understood. Also, of course, innovator's dilemma hits us all the time. The problem with the innovator's dilemma being that people are not stupid, but it's called a dilemma because it's a dilemma. So I am in a company that has its constraints, so I'm not able to see my problem, of course. And I cannot say, yeah, <laughs> again, I'm totally sorry for you, but, you know, can't you see the option? Can't you come up with the right solution? No, he can't. He's inside of the company, even though I've just hired him. Anyway, he's part of the company, so he's part of the problem. He cannot see the new ways. Because what our company does right now, because we're fully hit by innovators' dilemma, is we optimize our current business model. We are not here to find a new business model because it looks scary. That's the innovator. A new business model looks scary to us. So, okay. I was blaming now all the time, and Gerd is not actually that stupid and so on. So, actually, what is innovation? Oops, too fast. So, who knows this innovation matrix? It's really, really famous. So, we have on one axis, we have how well is the domain defined we try to innovate in, and on the other axis, we have how well is the problem defined we want to innovate in. So if I, I don't go through the whole thing, it's like if you don't actually have a good understanding of the domain and you don't have a very well understanding of a problem to go for, it's called basic research, of course. It's like doing maths. I found this funny, nice direction. I just want to go for it. and Let's see what I find out. So it's really basic research. Might be valuable, might be not. It's really, really undirected. So this comes back to my question in the beginning. What actually is innovation? All of this is innovation, although it looks really, really different. So kind of the opposite of this is sustaining innovation. We actually know in what domain we want to innovate. We actually know the problem we want to innovate in. An example would be music industry as a domain. And the problem might be, I actually want to carry a thousand songs with me. Oh my god, the iPod. That's sustaining innovation. Disruptive innovation is more like Google-ish. Something like, you know, the domain is not, it's really well defined, but we don't know what we actually want to do, but let's go for it. An example would be navigation for Google. Let's buy some maps, some rights on it, let's put it to the market for free and see what's going to happen. It's the same what Amazon does with the gaming engine. We have a plan, the others don't have a plan, they are surprised, they're really hit by what we call the OODA loop, we played a game for a while, now we surprise everybody, and we have a better plan than all the others. So here's some examples. <coughs> Apple likes to do this. So one of the jobs of jobs was come up with the right domain and the right problem, and then let's hit it, and then hand off to all the talented guys we have. Um, Google is more acting down here. This is why it looks so surprising sometimes what they do, and a little bit planned is in what I call kind of a spoiled brat approach. They have all the money in the world, and just, they just want to go for any option. It looks a little bit unplanned, I, but I think they have a plan behind there somehow. So this is really basic research. What we see with if we, if we take Park and, and all the Xerox things we know from the past, they're of course of the problem that they sometimes don't know what they going to do with their power they have. So they find all these great things, but they don't find an application. Sometimes 
one of these guys comes along and says, oh, well, you know, they find, found great stuff, we will use it. And this, um, I like the Procter and Gamble thing here, like, the dom domain is not very well defined, but the problem is very well defined. I will explain a little bit, bit uh, more in depth later on with an example. This is another one. Um, actually, I, I have the slide on here because Tim Castell is just such a great guy. So if you want to learn anything about innovation, read his blog. He doesn't have any book out as far as I know, but his blog is fantastic. Uh, he's catching up everything that's coming up in innovation. This is one matrix he built. So basically, he has come up with the two axes of innovation commitment. Do we want to actually really, really innovate or not that much? And can we actually do it? So are we competent in doing it? And this difference between not innovating very much to being bewildered, oh my god, we can move things on the market. Yeah, because we're just so committed, but we actually don't know how we found it out because we're not that good in innovating. So something happened to us which actually made us a good guy on the market. <coughs> so on the other axis, it's like um, if we are not um, that much committed, but we're really good at it, we can come up with unicorns. For example, um, in the beginning, what you call a unicorn is something like Facebook, which just comes up with the right idea, some doesn't really know how to execute, but somehow gets the right investor money. And it turns out it was actually a brilliant idea by this guy called Zuckerberg. Um, who might not be that much of a genius, but with the right context, actually it works. It turns out that these unicorns make up, what is it, 0.05% of the startups. So if you think you're a unicorn like Facebook, <laughs> I wish you luck. So looking to be the next Facebook is actually the recipe for disaster, so don't try it. So this is another model of innovation. Who knows this one? I mean, I'm in the design thinking group Munich, so everybody should scream, yes, I actually defined it. No. Okay, you know it. So this is the knowledge funnel. Roger L. Martin, a really great um, thinker behind the design thinking community, came up with it in his brilliant book, The Design of Business. And what he explains with it is basically how companies, products, services, things, features, products come into being. So it all starts at the top, of course, with a mystery. So a guy brighter than me runs around and says, you know, wouldn't the world be a better place if we just did something about this? Like Steffi came up with what would actually be a chance to come up with a better meetup experience? That's a good problem to solve. We should do something about the meetup experiences. So, that's a nice mystery. What could we actually do? And I think it might be valuable. So the guy runs around and says, you know, I came up with an interesting problem. Um, I don't want to stress you again, so I <laughs> take this poor guy. So, <laughs> what's your name? Easy. Niels, that's easy. So Niels, what do you think? Uh, I came up with this meetup idea. What do you think? I mean, is it a valuable problem? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm already, you know, yeah. it's already, this, the spontaneous reaction was, you know, not that interesting in the beginning. So I might have to frame it a little bit different. I could come up to you guy, Oliver, you know, last week I've been to this terrible meetup somewhere in Cologne. It was really terrible. And this brought me to the following idea. So uh, first of all, what went wrong is it was like 40 people in a room. And actually, everybody was falling asleep and everything. And actually, it was at the end of the day. So. My talk was actually really brilliant, but nobody reacted. I think we should solve this meetup problem in the evenings, kind of to spice it up a little. What do you think? Let's talk about it. I had the same problem. Okay, I mean, <laughs> it's late in the evening. I take that into account, but he reacted, and it was a bit on my content. So, yeah, it was a bit more successful than the first try. So, I work on my pitch, and I go around, and I try to to see if people actually react to it a little bit more. After a certain time, I might find some people who say, yeah, 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 right, meetups, evening. I mean, it's really crazy stuff, all these interesting topics, but I can't take them up anymore. So I found a valuable problem, is what I think at a certain time. And I'm somehow down here. And the more and more I talk with people, I might also fail, by the way, then I stop the experiment and come up with the next mystery. So after a certain time, I get some hints from the people what they actually would dream of as, um, as a solution. And I try to actually now to pitch the solution. You know, there's all these 
terrible evening meetings, you know, and I came up with this idea to actually let it be sponsored by Monster and come up with these great energy drinks so it might happen something and maybe somebody picks it up and so on. And I'm down here, I, and if people react, I found a heuristic. There is a pattern in my solution that actually makes people trigger. So in a more famous case, um, let's think something up, like Amazon. Um, you know, I came up with the ideas of, of selling books online, then people might come in and say, you know, why should I order a book online? There's all these bookstores, yeah, but I deliver it faster than the books, bookstores could actually deliver it and you can send it back all the time and whatever, and there's no personal contact needed, you know it when you go to a bookstore and the guy says, oh no, you should read this book, but you're really interested in, you're in this personal conflict with them and so on. And uh, so some people say, yeah, yeah, do it. Now I'm here. And now I come up with the product, and I try to build the first prototypes and so on, and try to refine it until I found the recipe, and now it really scales. So that's this model. And the thing is, with this model, is it explains so many things. First of all, don't build the product right away up here. Don't build Amazon because you have the idea. Build Amazon when you have validated the idea through very, very many phases and through many, many experiments. Then you can actually build the product because it's really expensive to build every idea's product and then throw it away right away. So. A problem is that in the software industry we are not used to this because the cost of actually coming up with software is so low compared to the cost in the other industries like manufacturing industries. If you talk to any people supplying parts to car um, companies and so on, they would never actually build the production line to come up with um, Scheinwerfer. What's Scheinwerfer? Yeah, with a headlight until they've proven that the headlight actually works, the innovation is great, we need the LED light around the curves, and we actually have people buying it. This is when they actually built the production line. And all the research is up here. Until they didn't validate this, they don't build the production line. We guys in software just have the production line there anyway, 80 to 400 developers. The main job of the product owner is to actually get the stories right and ship them over to the development team so they can come up with the software and build it anyway. Who cares? We actually also don't measure the success of all the features because we have the developers anyway. So we kind of forget about this model and jump down here right away. The problem is when we unlearn that we have to actually earn the production we go there again to Niels and say, you know, Niels, the Zuckerberg guy came up with Facebook right away. You know, it hasn't been a real problem for you. I mean, you look smart. So what's the next success we could have? I give you a week. You have a fancy team. What's your name? Sebastian. Take Sebastian. Jakob also, he's still here. You might even insource Gerhard again. And I want you to come up with a really bright idea. What's the next feature we make money with in a week? Because, you know, middle of March, I have this meeting with the CEO. And he needs my new roadmap. OK? 15% more revenue would be fine for your feature. Thanks. Jakob, you know what to do. Kick him in the ass a little, because I know sometimes he's a little slow. OK? Gerhard. <laughs> so. <coughs> What, we, what I want from Niels and Jakob and Gerhard right now is, you know, all this is rubbish, what we did for all the years in the industry. Actually, jump right here, have a clue of what will scale right away, and just do it. Please. So, there's a little mistake in what we do right here. So, another view on innovation is the following. Um, who knows the three horizon model? Okay. So, this was invented and documented by the great guys of McKinsey. I think around 1997 or something in the original paper has a uh, title something like continuous growth. So what they describe with the model is what do companies actually do to guarantee continuous growth on the market for themselves. And what they say is companies have to work on all these three levels, horizons, to guarantee continuous growth. The first horizon is about making money of what we have today. 
of the products and services we offer today. And to do that, we actually have to perfect them over time to increase them in quality, predictability, in maintainability, whatever. So basically, this is operational excellence. And to do so, of course, we sometimes have to add some features and so on. And the good thing about it is even Niels and Jakob and Gerhard can come up with these features because we know what to do. Because for Horizon On, we need to do what's expected from us. So I can go to customer service and to the sales guys and say, Oliver, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Oliver, what are the five top demands of our clients? And Oliver will come up with a list of the five top demands of clients and I'm just going to hammer them into the product in Horizon 1 say, well, you know, here it is. And clients will be happy and say, yes, the company did what I wanted them to do. They understood. Jakob and Gerhard and Niels are a winning combination. They maintain the product. So Horizon 2 is something totally different. This is about how can we make money from one year from now to three years from now. And I tell you something, the expectation on this is hockey stick growth all the time. No? It's not linear stuff like plus 7% every year, like with the market, it's more than that. And it's okay that it needs to be more than that because this stuff here only delivers linear growth at best with the market and nothing more. Horizon One is actually the death cycle of each product. I just ask the clients what they want, I build it in and we decline. If we just build what the clients need, we will go down because we don't self solve new problems anymore. Horizon 2 is about finding out what new problems we need to solve for new people on the market so that they will additionally buy the, our products. <coughs> so, to do so, we need to come up with things we cannot do today. And here comes in the cultural problem. These guys working on that level come into the company each day with the chaotic thoughts of what we could actually do to solve our problem on the market. And of course, it's always things we cannot do today. And we, working on this down here, being overloaded with, I don't know, 536 emails each day, we will be totally annoyed by what they tell us. Because everything they will tell us is stuff we cannot do already. So, these guys might say, you know, the product is nice in Germany. I came up with a nice proposition for Italy and Spain. So please guys, come up with the same product for Spain, just without customer support. And we say, you know guys, it's really hard to make the product, product just for Germany. How, how could we? It's just impossible what you want from us. But that's their job. They need to come up with new options for new people, for new problems all the time. So Horizon 3 is a little bit more complicated even. It's like, how can we make money from three to six years ahead? And we need to be more abstract, abstract on this. So we actually take care about options on future growth. And um, this informs this and that informs that and so on. So I don't talk about this too much, but this conflict here is really heavy. So this already shows how hard innovation is because this is where innovation happens at the core. The only innovation happening down here is process innovation. How can we actually come up with a product a little cheaper? Well, you know, we could produce it like this and that and <laughs> hand it over to China or whatever. This is everything that's happening down here. Really boring stuff. So innovation, the real hardcore innovation is happening up here, but it's always an annoyance to our standing business. That's the problem with innovation. <coughs> so, after all these models of innovation, I want to show some strategy because innovation doesn't mean a thing if it just goes wild. So I want to show you what strategy means for innovation. So here, a modeling strategy with Wardley Maps, a great guy called Simon Wardley came up with it. What we do actually is that we differentiate products in the different phases of the life cycle. So I have an idea that's kind of a novel thing. So here we have novel to common. Here we have unknown to defined and certain. In the beginning, things are novel and unknown. We come up with a new idea, basically. After a certain time, we see that it actually works, and we say we custom build products to actually see if they work on the mass market or not. Because this is where we want to go. We want to go, wanna go to the mass market, where things are then defined and common. 
So the next step is out of the custom built things we come up with in the niche market, we come up with real product, which we can come up with on a product chain, in a, in a real production chain in a way. So I have basically a website where I can order this thing. Down here I still have to talk a lot with Gerhard and say, you know, there's a really unique thing and I need to find these and all those vectors and so on and so on. So it's a lot of bespoke activity going on. Nothing is standard here. And I want to drive it to the next category where everything is standard and I have three models and you can just choose. And then I want to come up with a commodity product or utility. Basically, this is like uh, electricity or water from the sink. This is actually where every product wants to go. I have all the reach. The problem is I have little margin up here. So, but that's kind of the, the cycle of, of products. So this is a Wardley map. What we map is products from Genesis to custom build to product to, to utility. And up here we map the visibility to the customer. So the strategy map I want to come up with first with to show some examples is what would actually a, an online photo platform look like in a Wardley map? I want to come up with an online photo platform and that's visible to the customer. That's what he actually sees. That's why it's up here. Um, what we need to go with it is actually oops, <coughs> online image storage and online image manipulation. So this is really novel stuff to the left. We don't have much experience with it, but it should be visible to the client because that's our differentiator on the market. Can you follow me? So that's what we want to offer. Now what we map down here is what do we actually need to offer that product? Oh, to actually make money we need some payment, we need a website, we need a CRM system, we need a platform. Oops, I forgot what that is and I just doubled the platform, some mistake. So this is what we need, but we need some more. We need stuff like a data center, computing power, and actual power, electricity. So all of this we need to actually be offering that one. So if you look at the market, <coughs> and there's another guy just like us, with just the same elements, how could we improve our offering? What would we need to do? Well, we have some chances. So this is what the client sees. We could attack on the CRM because there, it makes no sense to actually have kind of a standard product with CRM where there are actually utility products out there on the market like SAP. So we have kind of a homegrown maybe, an amateur CRM. We can actually attack the, con the, the, um <coughs> the competition on the market to be better in CRM. We have the better relation to our client through that. Same is we could, why do we actually host our stuff ourselves? You know, we, we have all this Amazon web hosting. Why do we need to actually focus energy on having the computing power inside of our house? Amazon does it all for us. We could release all these 20 people and get 20 bright people in to actually do all the hosting for us. So it makes no sense to have it in-house. If you want to drive this way, we can just change this over to utility, to where Amazon is with its hosting and just do it. Same with payment. We have some kind of a bespoke product here. We just, I mean, we were a startup, we were young, we needed the money, we were stupid. We just built the payment into it. Let's move it over to professional solution. And the same over here. So there's clear vectors where we could actually attack the market. So we have more time to actually invest in this one and move this over here as well. So we get the standard product faster than the other ones. Just by focusing our efforts on the product by pushing these things over here. So now there's actually two innovation ways of innovation I, I came up with in this diagram. The first one is process optimization, pushing things over to the side, to the more utility part of the diagram. And the other one is making things accessible as a product that we actually came up with internally and offering to the customer. And that's more disruption. We came up with stuff by chance, now we offer it to the customer, a new offering. 
examples. So was the model somehow understood? I turn things to the right, I get more operational ex uh, excellence, I push things up, customer sees new product. <coughs> so what did Amazon do with the uh, Amazon Cloud? So some years ago, a guy called Werner Vogel came up with a Dynamo shopping cart. And what he did with it, he actually solved an Amazon problem. So there needs to be kind of um, a globalized shopping cart for all the clients who are able to um, order their stuff on the website from everywhere around the globe. And it was over here. It was a custom built thing just working for Amazon. They solved their own problem. Now, over time, it went over here. And by going over here, they said, you know, it's a bit stupid to use a DB that is not in the cloud. So we come up with a cloud database inside of Amazon in our cloud service, which you use internally, and some other parts of a whole IT system. And now, actually, we have a whole computing system in the cloud, which other people could actually use. So Werner Vogel said, you know, we could offer it to other people. What we do internally with operating our software, we could actually offer to all the companies out there as a utility, like electricity from the socket. And let's call it AWS, what it's called today. So that was a radical step. It looks just so nice. But imagine, I mean, you're this bookstore, I don't know, electronics store, whatever, and your CTO comes along and says, you know, what I built, what I came up with in operating our software is so brilliant, we should actually sell it. I mean, in, in the companies I was working, everybody would go like, what do you actually want? You know, do your job, operate the stuff, but how could we actually sell it? It's not a business model we're known for. We sell books. What are you doing? So the innovation was to offer something that's used inside and making it so perfect that it can be offered to the outside. So, and the great thing about it was now they can offer Lumberyard and Twitch on top of all this stuff. And the next thing, and the next thing, and all the infrastructure they built and offered to the outside can now be used to attack all the other markets. So this is how Amazon works on that. And it's a pattern. If you look at what they did with books, they offered the books somehow, a custom-built site somehow working, somehow getting more perfect to a product. They built some logistics service and everybody thought they're crazy. I mean, the comments at the time when they built all the huge warehouses was like, what are they doing? Why do they reinvest all the money in logistics? Something which is already solved by DHL and how they are called. <coughs> so they built all the logistics services, which propels books up here because logistics are now so brilliant that it's a commodity service. Everybody buys books at Amazon. And they start offering food over the same channels and electronics and so on. And what they do now is they offer actually the logistics service as a service as well. And this is basically the Amazon marketplace. If it works so well for us, why shouldn't it work for others as well? And this is how they disrupt the market. Services they built for themselves are offered to the outside, enabling totally new options on the market. So what happened with the iPhone? <coughs> there were smartphones, web calendar, email. It somehow worked down here. So the strategy, of course, of Apple is to come up with something up here, which has a better UI, as you guys said. Make it one offering, call it iPhone. Building some music as well, and a music service to it. Apps, of course, which they discovered later on. And then they discovered this thing, the smartphone industry totally eats the world. So the growth of the smartphone industry is unprecedented. It kind of does this to the PC market. This is the PC market, this is the smartphone market. And so smartphones are connected, smart stuff. So we're on here, the iPhone is up here, fitness trackers appear, smartwatches appear. What do I need to do as Apple? I need to come up with an offering in this market. What I want to do on the market is, and that's the innovation Apple style, 
pull it up here. What others somehow get right, they want to get really right and make it a commodity product over here. So this is why the iPhone is the number one smartphone on the market, even if you like it or not, it doesn't matter. It makes 95% of the smartphone revenue in the market only by having 16% of the market share. But the revenue share it has is 95% of the margin. So, same will happen with iWatch. People might not like it, whatever. The margin is on the iWatch, not on all these other Android devices, because they don't go for margin. So, this is what they do. Now, another piece of innovation is this, this one. <laughs> so, that's what Procter & Gamble does. So, what is ac actually Procter & Gamble going for? They want to have square meters in this offering. It's just about display area in the market. So, they want to find all these nice offerings with design thinking and whatever you see, just to have more square, square meters in the offerings in the market. Now some confusion, what's the mobile industry doing right now? This is where every, every company wants to have some real estate here rather than here. It's the same game. Why everybody wants to have a mobile app is just to have real estate on your home screens so that you see it and use it, see it and use it all the time. So most of the tricks they do are not about value to create but coming up with small triggers for you to use what you have on your real estate. <coughs> so there's a funny little thing about monopolies as well. Who wrote the Peter Thiel book that came out last year? Really interesting, really counterintuitive. So he's totally going for monopolies. You need to build a monopoly. If you want to do innovation, you need to build a monopoly. And why? The opposite of a monopoly is basically a restaurant. If you're coming up with a restaurant down here somewhere, it's about competition. You want to be better than the next restaurant around the corner. Your pasta needs to be better than the pasta of the restaurant around the corner. So it's all about, you know, it's low margin business. It's about competition all the time. If you're in a low margin business with competition all of the time, you will not make money, which allows you for innovation because innovation is expensive. So what you need to do is you come, need to come up with a monopoly in a certain market, in a certain segment, so that you get a huge amount of the money in that segment that you can reinvest to innovate the whole segment, basically. <coughs> so, it's important because it means that we cannot start with the whole industry. We always need to start with the segment, which is the same thing that the knowledge funnel told us. We cannot go for the scaling model right away. We need to go for a segment where we have a monopoly to actually counter all offerings in that small segment. So, monopolies don't have the best um, image out there in the world. If you think about patents, software patents, any patents, what they do is actually they ensure to you a, a monopoly on your innovation for a certain amount of time. So, who doesn't like monopolies shouldn't be in favor of patents, of course, because all they do is they ensure that your intellectual property is yours for a certain amount of time. So, patents are a form of monopoly in a way. Now to something simple. So, that was the theory part, now come the stories. <coughs> what can I do in my company to actually enable innovation. So I didn't tell you about that part all of the time. I just explained about what are models innovation, what works, what doesn't work, how should it work. Now, what can I do? And there's this really fantastic model of pioneers, settlers, and town planners, and it goes like this. If you look at, um, at plants, what's happening? I mean, the desert is really, it's cold in the night, it's hot in the day, there's little humidity, so it's really hard for plants to go there and settle, in a way. So what's happening in the beginning, there's a little condensation, there go some plants with some um, seeds, and it looks like this in the beginning. So they rot and they build a, li build a little bit of, um, of earth down here, and something like this can happen after time. The settlers come in. In biology, they're called case strategies. They're totally different. 
whereas the pioneers are totally resistant against the contrast of the surroundings, like hot and cold and wet and dry, these are not that tolerant against these contrasts, but they're really tolerant against other species coming in. Whereas the pioneers die off when other species are coming in. So after the time of this, we actually reach the climax of the vegetation, which looks like this, which we know in Middle Europe, <coughs> until a volcano breaks out or a sea comes in and actually floods the whole area and then the whole thing starts again. So in society, it's like this. We have the pioneers and they live, for example, at the seaside. And what they do is they say, you know, what's actually behind the sea over there? And they want to find out just because they can, because there is the seaside. They want to know what's behind it and they go there with a the boat. And on day number 30, there's a mutiny, of course. We know the stories. And on day 31, the mutiny is over because they see some grass in the water and some birds coming in. And what they say is, yes, we discovered India. And they get on land and they find out it's America and they fight the wars they need to fight and they need to get the sickness and the disease they need to have. And they go on and on and they take some people with them until they found a really great place at the seaside with a mountain behind and say, some people should stay here. Just some people should stay here and build a small town. And some people do so. And they build some wooden houses and some rocky roads and they build a church and a school and after time more and more people come because it's really a fancy place. So the whole place starts to stink and reek and it doesn't work anymore and it's too much people in too small place. And then they think about, you know, we had the problem before in Europe and we had some people actually being able to help us and these were the town planners. And they come in to scale it to the max and we have San Francisco in front of them. They come up with electricity and they look at the city what that was built before and say, what a mess. What a total mess you guys built. And the settlers say, what do you have? You know, I mean, we needed to build it this way. We just needed to build it this way. Because we just had what we had. We needed to get the woods from, from out there. We needed to build the houses as we can and so on. And now these guys come along and do it right. And the thing is, the pioneers are gone, some of the settlers are gone, and there's a whole total new kind of people over here. So this is what's happening. Pioneers come roaming, find a nice place, tell it to the settlers, the settlers come in, build a real nice first city, and then the town planners come in and build the real town. Pioneers are gone, parts of the settlers are gone, and so on. So here's the thing. What does it mean for our companies? We have different types and we need different types in the company just as the three horizon model tells us we need all of the horizons to be worked on. Because horizon two will die against horizon one if we don't consciously manage that. Because horizon two is a total pain for us all the time, hearing all the excuses of what we cannot do. So, pioneers are happy under conditions of failure, bets and intuitions in uncertainty. They love experience, they love to be on the search and explore things. I make it short because it's late. On the other side, we have town planners who hate failure. They love efficiency. They hate intuition, they love metrics. They love analysis. They love, love scientific models. They only want to build what's required. And I think this should ring somehow like a pattern to you. Who is not living in a company where we have this fight all the time? You know, I want to try something new. No, 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 no. I mean, you were a guy like this, you know, you came up with new ideas and I said, no, 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 we don't do it. And it's happening like this all the time. And the problem behind it is that we actually know one model from management, which is this one. Do what's right, do it right now, do it very perfectly. And this is the enemy of this one. So what we need to learn in companies is to manage for all these three models. We need to manage for the pioneers. We need to manage for the settlers. We need to manage for the town planners, not just for one. And we see that the conditions they're happy under are totally different. So managers need to learn to manage for these conditions and different qualities. So this is something we also see in the methodology wars out there. 
the, the, the goal of a methodology is, is that he comes in and says, you know, my method works everywhere. I'm doing Scrum, so Scrum works from here to there. I do Lean, so it works from here to there. In reality, Agile is very bi biased to the left side. We do bespoke things, things have change all of the time, so we need to be agile and open to changes all of the time. Whereas going to the right, what I want to do here is I want SAP in my company with all the problems that SAP brings because I don't want to care about bespoke software management anymore and software development anymore. I just want to have SAP in here, SAP HR. Who cares? So I'm even going for methods like Six Sigma over here, the, the, the enemy of innovation. Why? Because I do not need innovation over here. I do know what CRM means. Just give me some CRM. And if it's just a mailing list, I don't care, but just give me CRM. But let's not discuss on how to do it all the time. You know, I, just give it to me. Who doesn't believe in Six Sigma? Six Sigma is the backbone of the quality of the customer service of Amazon. So that's the effect you can have with Six Sigma. No Six Sigma, no customer care quality at Amazon. So there is some value in it, even if you don't like it sometimes, but it's the right thing in a very highly industrialized environment. Some really advanced contextual stuff. What we like all the time is we say, you know, we need alignment to actually have autonomy. We need to discuss on alignment all the time. Everybody needs to align, be aligned to the strategy of the company. Yes, but on the very left, we need to defer alignment and just come up with some very loose framing because otherwise we don't have diversity in the company, which will kill the innovation that it's needed here to create new stuff. So we need to optimize for new stuff over here and for standardizing over here. So alignment is crucial on the right and deferred on the left. So now some common dysfunctionalities in the model and in companies. <coughs> What's happening if we don't have town planners? So it's really late. Who dares to come up with a suggestion? What's happening? I think you cannot grow. Absolutely, you will never scale. So all the people hailing this, hating the Six Sigma guys and the I need the specification guys and so on, you will never scale. These guys cannot live with ambiguity. You need to be crystal clear to these guys right away. Otherwise, don't bring them in, but you will not scale. If you're not prepared to go this way, you will not scale, and it's fine. So it's a decision. But if you want to scale, you need these guys. So what's happening with this one? It's not that hard. Um, where do the good ideas come from, actually? Somebody else has yeah. You're not prepared for market interruption or surprise. The problem is you will never have a new product at all, you know? So what pioneers come up with new ideas, settlers are dying to take them to the world to build the first product, town planners are scaling them. So if you don't have the pioneers in the company anymore, you're lost. You, don't, you will never have a new idea. That's the point. No new products. So, what's happening if you don't have the settlers in the company? You never get a product, you just have ideas and you will never have Absolutely, a and who doesn't know it, you know? We have, we have all the bright ideas, but we never do anything of it. It's because we don't have the settlers who re are really dying to actually take them out to the world for the first time. So, a hint is, if you're in a startup and you're just starting your startup, only go for settlers. So if you just have few people, the settlers are brilliant because they still understand the pioneers and they can later on understand the town planners. What lots of startups do, they start with the pioneers and hire the town planners right away, which means total war. <laughs> because these people are so different. And these guys are always complaining like, you know, it might be some bright ideas, but these guys, I cannot talk to them, they're really chaotic and it's a new idea every day and they don't have a strategy and they don't follow up on anything because the settlers are missing. And these guys say, you know, 
I have all these great ideas, but the idiots I'm working with are not able to deliver anything because we're not delivering anything since two years, because we're just planning and planning and planning and coming up with the right system, the right quality, but my clients are running away. That's the situation. So basically, this means war. The funny thing is that Gardner actually recommends this. So bimodal IT. You have the standard IT, and if you're stuck with innovation, you just get some of these guys on the quick track, put them into the company somewhere in your corner, have great ideas, have some really quick developers with them who actually develop this stuff, and then you will be happy. And in fact, what you have is war because these people will not talk to each other. And what they will say is, you know, nice guys privately, nice sandbox experiments, but not for our product. And these guys say, you know, all the great ideas we have, but they will never see the day of light. I'm sorry. So this doesn't work, sadly. So there's one other um, dysfunctionality, and I came up actually with it when I went, um, this is the, the place around the Cologne Dome. And I went there, and all of a sudden I looked to the right and said, oh, there actually is a dome. I didn't realize it actually, because the place is so ugly. It's as undomey as you can think of any place. Like if you gave me the task of coming up with a place that doesn't have anything to do with the dome, it would be the Domplatte in Köln. You wouldn't, if you, there was no dome, it would be the most undomey place in the whole world. So anything that just makes it a Domplatte is the dome itself. Around no more inspiration of small shops, a marketplace or anything that was around when the dome was actually built to get closer to God and whatever, you know. That's the idea of the place, get closer to God and... So, around here it's really a dirty small street where you actually are afraid of being hit by somebody. So it's really, and I'm not talking about what happened on Sylvester, so it's really one of the most ugly places, most dysfunctional places, except traffic goes north and south and east and west. So that's everything that works. So, what went wrong? What went wrong to come up with a place like this? And my theory is this. So, of course, we had peer pioneers starting with the dome and the place around it, and we had settlers actually kind of settling around it. And now we have town planners, and they're not stupid, I guess. You know, it's, they must have done something great to actually get the contract to come up with it. <coughs> but what I think is there was no information whatsoever going on from one stage to the other. And that's what's happening in companies also all of the time. Somebody has a really great idea and he throws it over to Gerhard and says, you know, come up with a product, please, in just three months' time. And he, I have a two-hour conversation with Gerhard as being a pioneer, of course. And Gerhard, being a settler, says, yeah, okay, I got it. Because he doesn't have more time, because he's such mud, so high under a shitload of work, doesn't have time to actually really understand what I want, just builds the product somehow, has his own ideas and so on, is really actually into it, but he doesn't actually know what it what it means, not because he's stupid, but just because he was managed in the wrong way. Get over with it, please, Gerhard. Build it, I want to see it. So the product's out there, with this actual story of the product is lost, and he's actually bored by the product. He hands it over to the town planner and say, you know, whatever, do with it what you want. And the town planners take over and say, yeah, I mean, that's really a mess, we make the best of it, but they don't have any clue what the pioneers actually found to come up with a product. So that's how a place like the Domplatte exists. Nobody actually remembers anymore what the dome was used to be and what it was meant to be. And we come up with a shitty place like this. So a last few words on the innovator's dilemma. So who knows the guy? So is he stupid? I mean, he said the iPhone will never be a success. I mean, is he stupid? No, he's not stupid, of course. And he's again in the innovator's dilemma, so he's not stupid, he's in a dilemma. He is there to protect the Microsoft business model at all costs, at all times. He cannot allow for the iPhone in his head to be a success because he m that means he would have missed this chance on the market. And believe me, he had strategists around him suggesting to him going onto the mobile market and he said, no, 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 no all of the time. 
but not because it's stupid, because it was against the business model of Microsoft, which we saw later on because the iPhone actually was a large part of destroying the Microsoft business model at the time. So he couldn't accept it. So all that's happening is this one. We have Bill Gates, the pioneer, and we have the settlers coming up with Microsoft Office and whatever and so on. And the pioneers kind of wandering off. And it's no surprise that at this time Bill Gates was in the background already. And they come up with all the business models and so on, and they really kind of hone the business model and make it perfect. And now even the settlers are gone, and all they do is kind of, we need to sell more office licenses and uh, Microsoft, so on, and such and such operating system, and so on. And that's all they can do at the time. And so what's the cure, of course, in that situation when the settlers are gone, the pioneers are gone, you need to have the pioneers come back into the company somehow which they tried hard. So, for example, what they did with Bing at the time was a totally different approach. A small team with lots of freedom on the side. They could do whatever they want. Just please give me a search engine. Guys, please give it to me. And then they scale it through the settlers and then re they really scale it through this. So this is the cycle you need to go through when you're dead because you just have town planners left in the company. So, um, some word of caution, it sounds a little like the pioneers are such great people and the town planners are so boring and so, it's not the case. As the horizon model tells us, these guys are making all the money, we need them to scale. These just have different type, they just want to see the product for the first time. These come up with some crappy ideas, some of which are valuable. So they're all valuable, we need them all. For a successful company, we need them all, they just have different talents. But we need all these talents and without any of them, one of them missing, we saw all the problems that come up. Some dangerous re rumors and myths about innovation. The moment of epiphany. Newton sitting in his garden, the apple falling from the tree and him having the epiphany of the Newton equations. All wrong. Read about it. There is no such thing. He is living in a community of other mathematicians and, um, and, and, and scientists and there's just something in the air, but there is something coming up and it might have something to do with gravity and all these things, so, and, and all the mechanical laws. So, of course he was no lonesome genius. No one is lonesome genius who will later on be successful. There is no known story of a lonesome genius coming up with something great. They're all interconnected. Also, there's never any overnight success. I still have a price going somewhere for somebody who can come up with, to me with an overnight success on any innovation story. I haven't heard of one. It's just that we remember Facebook after scaling and not before scaling. I, just for this talk, I looked up videos of Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg sitting around on a sofa like seven years ago and not having a clue, basically. So it was di very different before scaling than after scaling. We just remember the success. I can also privately remember when we st still had StudiVZ around. Can anybody remember? And the fight in Germany was about will StudiVZ at any time be as, as good an investment as Facebook? And people were thinking about where to invest in all these things. It was so close from the outside. So it was really crappy in the beginning. So here one innovation story to make it all transparent. So even this guy, he didn't come up with the equation writing it down on a black wall and saying, yes, E is MC squared. Oh my God, what I discovered. So even he had to come up with that equation through years of work, working in that um, Zurich um, library, reading all the books, reading all the papers, exchanging lots of letters with this guy, who knows who this is? Heisenberg? No, it's Niels Bohr. So it was in close contact with Niels Bohr and they were both kind of battling, very intellectually battling about who's closer to any breakthrough, whatever it might be. And what they discovered, both of them, a new mathematic tool which was discovered some 20 years before, which was Hilbert spaces. And they said, you know, these Hilbert spaces are really funny, we should try something with them. And this is what they did. It was kind of a race who might find out something with it. It was just a series of experiments. 
So basically what they did, they threw Hilbert spaces onto the Newton equations and looked what comes out of it. And one of the things that came out of it was E is MC squared. And then they took some time to actually understand what it means. So that much to the brilliant discovery and innovation of E is MC squared. It's nothing like an overnight success. It's nothing like a lonesome genius. It's like a network of huge amount of scientists slowly coming up with solving some problem around them. Some more counterexamples of overnight success. Uh, who knows who Phil Knight is? Nice. Right. His life was that he sold sports shoes from the trunk of his car since 1964, already having his PhD on marketing of sports shoes and so on. And until 1969, he was still employed as an accountant with all the knowledge he had about the sports market and sports marketing. Larry Page and Sergey Brin solved the Google index actually in 1996. In 1997, they wanted to actually sell it for two millions but didn't get the money. Now they're happy about it. They quit their student's job in 1998, something like this. John Legend, the Grammy winner, had his first album out 2000, but he quit his management consultant job in 2002, already being nominated for a Grammy. Henry Ford, and that's kind of the most shocking story for me, and I didn't actually know it until this talk. He was Thomas Edison's chief engineer. Who did know it? Those two famous guys were actually connected. I didn't have a clue. So they were connected. It, I was sure you know. <laughs> you know all these things. So he's a brilliant chess player. He knows all these things, and I don't know how he does it. Anyway, so it. Sorry? I meant not his, of course. Ah, okay. <laughs> So only two years after having received the patent for the carburetor and many more Im important things for building a car, he quit his job with Edison. So that's that much about patience or overnight success. So I was killed by this one, actually. So in real life, what to do successful founders and entrepreneurs tell us? Basically, they were never brilliant. What they say is, I didn't quit. I just didn't quit. Against all things that went against me, I just didn't quit. I was relentless. And basically, as Tim Castillo says, what they say is, I did dirty work that others weren't prepared to do, like Einstein and Bohr. They basically did dirty science work that others weren't prepared to do and didn't want to go for. <coughs> I love silver bullets because I don't believe in them. Here is one. But there's some truth about it. So how do people actually get creative if you need them to? Basically, what you see is that people who are creative in, later, in their later life, they grow up with very little rules in their life. So their parents steer them by a firm value framework rather than by telling them what to do for, you know, it's six o'clock, come to dinner and these things. It's, it's about values. We love to have dinner together whatever you make of it. And all of a sudden, guys turn up at 6 o'clock. So if you just tell these guys rules, they kind of break rules, whatever. And what we see is that they never break rules in a dangerous way because of their firm value framework. So they never go for hard drugs. They never go for stealing the neighbors, stealing banks, and so on, bank robbery. Um, they go for some Mariana once or twice and say, yeah, strange effects, whatever, come back to their normal life and kind of try what's happening at the boundaries of the value framework. And this is how they actually get some self-consciousness and are really up to trying things out. Whereas just breaking rules leads other people to, yeah, it hurt, I don't do it anymore, it hurt, I don't do it anymore, I quit it. So that's really interesting. The first rule of parents, if you want creative kids, nobody needs to have creative kids, so there's, there's no special value in it. It's just, if you want to know, the first rule is back off. Let them do what they want. Give them a firm value framework. It looks really dangerous if you raise your kids this way. It really looks dangerous. And give them a few rules, as hard as, as it is to actually to bear in your life. If you want to know more about this, there's a great new book out by Adam Grant called Originals. Fantastic read. So much truth in it. 
So what to do if you have a company? There's a message by Clayton Christensen, author of The Innovator's Dilemma and, and so on. What he says, the worst place to develop a new business model is from within your existing business model. We've seen it before. Go outside of the company. Just another example of how hard it is to go out of, of your business model. Who knows what this is? It's fantastic drinks by Starbucks. For example, the cupcake frappuccino blended cream beverage, or the cotton candy frappuccino blended cream beverage, or the cinnamon roll frappuccino blended coffee beverage, or the red velvet cake frappuccino blended cream beverage, and also the lemon bar frappuccino blended cream beverage. One of those drinks has coffee in it, this one. The others don't. So what's the problem? So imagine you having this idea, you know, there's all these teenagers lingering around, around 15, 16 in the afternoon, 14 years old. All the day, they, every day they come to us, spend 329 on a latte, tall, because they just want to be here. But when we ask them about this latte tall, what they say is, you know, actually, we hate it. It doesn't taste at all because, you know, we're not grown-ups, we're teenagers. We want to have fun, we want to have sweet drinks. So some new business guy comes along and says, oh, interesting, let's co-create something with these teenagers. And he comes up with this list of drinks. So he goes to the founder of Starbucks and says, you know, I have a great idea. Um, I want to come up with these great, fantastic sweet drinks as a core of our business offering. What the founder of the company says is, you know, you're crazy, get lost. Do you understand our brand? Our brand consists of, we are the company that actually industrialized better coffee than the niche corner shop, but we industrialized it. So it's not the best coffee on the world. There's some coffee specialists which make better coffee, but on average, our coffee is really branded, giving the size of our business. Also, we came up with a third place concept, so people like to come here for work. Also, your teenagers, I get it. After school, they want to come here. But also, there's something about social status and so on, whatever. Anyways, this is against the core of our brand. So again, get lost. It's a crazy idea. It, it doesn't work with our brand. Come, uh, go somewhere else to a different brand, try it with them. Actually, the idea is brilliant. What does it do? If you look at the Maslow pyramid of needs, and there's physiological needs like I'm hungry, I'm starving if I don't eat, safety, we know it, watch the entry of my cave, love and belonging, I belong to people, I'm a social animal, without getting love I will die also, I will get sick, have some esteem, and on the top of it some self-actualization. So what this does, coffee raises them from physiological needs and safety to love and belonging. I belong to this coffee club. Adding the third place gets some more up, but now actually having fashion drinks, fashion drinks for the teenagers, raises them even more up to esteem and maybe the boundary of self-actualization. I am what I am because I buy these drinks, as stupid <coughs> as it may sound, but this is what they do. <coughs> and somehow they got it, and this is why they do it. But, again, in any company I was working, I would never had the chance to actually try it. All my CEOs would have said, you know, get lost. This is crazy stuff. So, this is the innovator's dilemma. This is being forced to work from the inside of your business model. And what they do is they try to find new corners to the business model which are totally unconnected to what they do opening up new options. So, what do you need to do? In a few sentences, it's really late. Clarify who your company is, what it actually wants, get some self-consciousness around it, because that's what's missing in 98% of all the companies I know. What do you actually want? Who are you? What's your role in the world? Get some purpose, vision and strategy. Decide strategic steps. Choose an organization, for example, PST. Pioneers, settlers, town planners. 
because that takes care of having all these characters on board all of the time. A model would be to have this as professions and the disciplines be below it. So we have P designers, S designers, T designers, but we organize these professions. We hire pioneers right now, rather than town planners and so on. And then get some relentlessness in. So manage the dualities from insecurity to ambigu and ambiguity to security and clarity for different tribes in your company. And then actually what I told you about the kids, if you want these innovative guys, the creative guys in the company, you need to back off, let your people go far out of the company, get out of the building, what Eric Ries says. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks to Simon Wardley for the Mardley maps, the Pioneer Settlers Town Planners um, model, basically all his work, which somehow is founded by any crazy organization who's paying this guy. He was a CEO of, a, I don't know, Canon's subsidiary and all these things before. Now he's kind of a, a knowledgeable guy in a way, so that pays all the money. And finally, because it's really late and was long, thanks for your patience, attention, and time. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you. Most of the times, this talk is a little controversial because it breaks with some things like everybody can do everything and so on. So if there are questions, I would have time for two or three questions right now. If you're not too tight, otherwise we can have a drink over questions over there as well. So whatever. Is there a pressing question? Okay, then see you with a drink later on. Thanks.